Thank you, John. Cool. Thank you so much, um, Karen and uh, uh, and everybody. It's really, it's such a thrill to be here. Um, oh wow, I just got big on my screen. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try and keep myself smaller so I can see you. Um, so uh, yeah, it is. It's such a thrill to be here. I'm. Um, it's. Uh, I wish we could all be in the actual physical room together, um, but uh, this still feels like an incredible outing for me. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna talk to you guys today um, about this process of adapting uh, fiction into uh, film. And uh, I'm gonna talk about, I mean, I I'm in a sort of a, an interesting circumstance right now. And this is gonna be like a new, a new talk that I'm giving right now because it's, it's dealing with some, some new experiences. But um, the, uh, uh, I have a, a film that has just recently come out and has been uh, making the rounds and uh, it's uh, called First Cow and it's been, um, it's, it's out in the world now if, if anyone is interested, but it's based on a novel that I wrote um, like 20 years ago or so, um, around the time that I met Jay McCulloch actually. Um, we worked together at Tin House Magazine and that uh, was one of the amazing honors and thrills of my life too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and it was actually, this is the thing I was working on when I entered the office and met Jay for the first time. That's and it's true. been an incredibly, you know, it, it's been a, a lot of things have happened in the years between that and, and now. And it's, um, uh, I hope that it will be sort of interesting for you guys as writers to hear first, I mean, now I have sort of the benefit of, of hindsight on understanding kind of what I was trying to do in writing that novel and how uh, I put it together. Um, I had never written a novel at that time. And so uh, I had no idea if I was doing it right or wrong. And um, I now have a, a little bit better grip on it. Um, but, um, and then, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you in in like fairly, like uh, fairly concrete detail about the the stuff that the process of writing that, and then so that you can understand by the time we get to um, a couple of years ago and I was adapting it, just how radically I had to reimagine it for the process of uh, film. It was um, you'll you'll see in this process I hope that it was um, about as perpendicular uh, kind of adaptation as could be imagined. I mean, it, it really took the, the basic themes and a couple of the, so a couple of the, the elements and, and became a pretty new thing. And so um, this will be sort of a necessarily self-indulgent talk. Like I'll be talking about <laughs> my own process in a lot of ways, which is um, not something I normally would burden anyone with hearing, but um, because we're all in this craft thing together, I'm assuming it might be of interest to you. And um, and people like movies, you know, people like hearing about movies. So that's uh, hopefully going to be the the um, juicy part at the end. Um, so I'm just going to jump in, and uh, you know, I'll have a few things to show you along the way, and and uh, I'll be happy to answer the questions that we're when we're done. Um, so unlike having a child, uh, writing a novel rarely happens by accident. Um, it's very rare that someone uh, uh, happens to have uh, written a novel. Like almost always the desire to write a novel precedes the novel and usually even the idea of the novel itself. Like you kind of want to be a person who wrote a novel or you want to have the experience of writing a novel or you want to have written a novel um, and then you're kind of left with the problem of how of what that thing is going to be so i was around like age 30 or so when i got serious about the idea of actually writing a novel and um i won't uh i won't bore you with the years of dissipation that preceded that um, and the ways that I wasted my 20s. Um, but I was doing a lot of, a lot of different things, we'll say. Um, but um, there came a point where I was like, all right, if, I, if I'm going to be a person who wrote a novel, I've got to like figure this out right now. Um, 
And so I quickly learned that writing a novel is not like having a baby, but it is a lot like building a house. Um, you, you know, you have to um, think about what kind of houses you like. Like there's a lot of different kinds of houses and you suddenly are like, well, do I like a Tudor? Do I like a ranch? You know, what is the, what is the style that I want to, that I want this thing to be? Um, what kind of houses are popular right now? You know, what's the, what's happening in houses? You know, what's happening um, in my particular region as far as this house making goes. And so there's just a sort of process of, of education you have to go through. And then you start drawing, um, you know, plans for it. You have to sort of um, start making your outlines. I know there are, there are writers who um, talk about really finding their writing one, one sentence at a time and, and this sort of act of discovery going from, uh, you know, uh, word to word. That has never made that much sense to me. Like I'm someone who needs to have some sort of uh, map for myself or some kind of structure that I'm working with. And so um, it became a, an issue for me of, of um, starting to um, order in the materials in a certain way. And before I even fully understood what, what this house was gonna look like, there were a few, a few um, objects and things that I knew I wanted to get in there because I didn't have the whole, the whole thing. So what follows now is just gonna be um, some of the stuff that I wanted to get into this thing. Um, some, of the, um, some of them are images and characters. Some of them are more vaporous kinds of ideas, but um, before the thing found the shape, it needed to have something to shape. So, um, and this is just, uh, and just as a sort of aside, this is like, this is a, a bit of wisdom I like to um, express to people is that um, there's never a single source for an anything. Um, things always come from multiple places and writing a novel is, um, to me, it's, it's, you know, it's akin to building a ship while you're sailing it or um, uh, building a barrel from the inside is one way that I often think about it. There's like, you have to be doing a few things at once to kind of get the critical mass together. So um, yeah, the idea that there's some sort of primal wellspring of, a, of an idea uh, to me is, uh, has not ever been true. There's like a, a lot of things that, that you arrange together and try and create an energy between them. So um, one of the first things that I had uh, before I began this novel was I had a different novel. Um, and it was this novel, Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson, fitting in my thing here, uh, which came out in the um, uh, late 90s and um, was a book that I read that I found really interesting. And it's, um, I don't know if you guys know Neil Stevenson, he's like a sci-fi writer, um, but of a very like heady caliber. Um, he does, uh, um, I mean, he, he it it's, can be very technical. It's, it's very um, baroquely learned about um, the, uh, state of computer programming and virtual reality and all that kind of stuff. And this was a very intoxicating book for me at that time. Um, the basic idea of it is uh, there's a group of characters uh, during World War II, a, a batch of cryptographers, um, allied code breakers who are trying uh, to, to um, break some kind of uh, access code or something like that. And then there's another plot line in 1990s Silicon Valley um, which uh, involves the actual descendants of that group of, of cryptographers um, who are working in, uh, at that time, contemporary uh, Palo Alto or something, uh, doing their own uh, cryptologic telecom computer technology stuff. And the plot uh, is, is sort of less important for me at this moment than the structure of this book. <clears throat> um, it was like a really simple and transparent structure. Um, there was like a time period before and a time period contemporaneous or contem a contemporary time period. And <clears throat> these two things just flashed back and forth to each other and they were inherently bound to each other because the characters in both, in both of them kind of shared the same DNA and some of the same, um, you know, uh, 
thematic life experiences going on. And there was a, a kind of an inherent, um, an inherent uh, momentum that was created by, by understanding that these two, these two bound periods were going to somehow reflect on each other. And like, this is one of those things where, you know, it's very obvious in retrospect, but you know, I had been reading plenty through my uh, first 30 years of my life, but I don't think I had fully grasped um, the power of a braided narrative. Um, that there is a kind of piston-like thing that happens when you're cutting from one story to another story and that there is just um, a, a mechanical thing that happens there. And so in a sense, this was just me discovering the idea um, in, of, of, of cross-cutting in a certain sense. Um, and this sounds kind of mechanistic and, and you know, uh, overly, um, super egoic, I think, about uh, the process of, of um, novel writing. <clears throat> but I think it can sometimes get skipped over in, in um, the sort of more mystical processes that we talk about in workshops, you know, about finding one's voice and everything. Like this is just like, this is a, a thing that people have done, I realize, that allows them to um, create a structure that they can fill. So I had this idea, okay, um, you know, I wish I was smart enough to like be a Virginia Woolf or some stream of consciousness person and just sort of flood a page with incredible thoughts. You know, I wish I was Saul Bellow, but like I'm not, I'm not smart enough to do that. And so I need to strap myself to some sort of structure. So I had this one. I'm like, all right, I'd like to do one that goes back and forth in time. So that's like an idea. All right. Um, then I also had um, a character that I was interested in. And I'm gonna try sharing the screen right now. Um, <laughs> the character derived from a beer commercial that was popular in uh, Oregon in the 1980s. And I'm gonna, through the wonders of the internet, I'm going to show you that beer commercial right now. Um, <laughs> hold on one second. Um, Back when the West was young. Where did you have to send to to get that sound? Getting just about anything took a lot of time and trouble. Mexico. Even a good beer was a rarity. Anybody want a Henry's? Henry's. In fact, to get the West's finest beer. In the White Hart? Beer drinkers would sometimes wait for months. Just come in the town. Because it would often have to come from hundreds of miles away. Where'd they have to send to to get that beer? Oregon. But while it may seem unusual to have taken so much time and trouble just for a better beer. Now for supper. It really wasn't. There's a few things that's not on the regular menu. Even then, Westerners always tried to do everything in a very special way. In addition way. to the beef, we have a nice loin of buffalo in a light cream sauce. Our fresh fish tonight is brook trout almondine. Where'd they have to send to you to get that cook? Broiled over mesquite with a juniper berry dressing. Los Angeles. There's roast antelope with a peach brandy glaze. Braised jackrabbit on croot, rattlesnake fritter, herb tomatoes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so that is a Henry Weinhardt's beer commercial from the mid 80s. Karen, do you remember that ad? Were you in Portland, in Oregon at that time? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was so witty. It was, I, I was a teenager when that came out. Um, and uh, that beer was like, Henry Weinhardt's was like our beer of choice as adolescents. That was like, you know, I was already halfway there because I really liked that beer. Um, but, uh, but more so, I found that, that ad, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time. This, this is another thing about inspirational things. Like you don't know that it's inspiring you at the time, but uh, you know, a decade later, I turned out I was still thinking about it because there was something about that ad that I found actually so dense and so sophisticated in a certain way. Um, and the idea that we, that we could understand so um, quickly this kind of stock <coughs> cookie character um, that has appeared in a thousand Westerns um, you know, for a total of about four minutes. Um, and we could graft him into this like West Coast Nouveau cuisine kind of idea in such a efficient way and that, and uh, also, 
make a basically homophobic joke about it. You know, like, I don't know if you notice his little earring in his uh, ear there and like, cause he's from uh, Los Angeles, which, you know, is immediately sort of suspect in some way. Like there's a kind of a density of like regional and sexual and historical information in that, in that advertisement that like, apparently never, <laughs> never left me. And um, so I had, I mean, honestly, and it wasn't even entirely my idea. This is like, uh, <clears throat> I really distinctly remember having, well, th this does get to sort of my 20s, like having, you know, taking bong hits on the porch in Portland, talking about what would be a great movie? How about a movie about a cookie? You know, like it just sort of was one of those conversations that came up. I remember exactly who I was talking to. It was my friends, Brian and, and Jason. And like, it was one of those like, thousand ideas that never happened you know it was just like that would be a funny idea but it did it stuck in my mind I'm like I'd be interested in doing a story about the cook you know the cook on a wagon train like what is the experience of that person and particularly if that person is is out of sync in a sense with the regimes of masculinity that are um that are surrounding him you know like what would be that was a cute ad, but like you could write a novel about that guy. <laughs> so that was kind of a part of in my, in my mind. So that was, so that that also is is an element. Okay. So I've got all right. I want two time periods. I want to cook. All right. Um, and then all right. I'm going to turn now to a more um, abstract sort of influence that was shaping my thinking at that time. Um, and that has to do, and, and you might have already kind of clued in about this, but um, I, was, I was interested in my mid-20s and late 20s in uh, the sort of concept of regionalism as an idea. Um, and that, that, that itself is, an, is, a, is an interest that kind of stemmed from a few sources. Um, one of them, again, went back to teenage times and um, being involved in, uh, you know, music scene stuff and uh, having, starting to understand that at that time, the sort of, um, I mean, at that sort of post-punk uh, music world was an, an intensely regionalist sort of uh, um, scene and, 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 uh, and um, institution in a certain sense. And that going to see a band from Arizona or from Boston or from Athens was partly a way of building a national map for oneself, you know, for at least for me, it was that way. And I think for a lot of people, it was that there was something extremely localized, but also um, uh, a, a communication between different locales going on. And I found that like to be an interesting like way of thinking about things, that things were springing from certain kinds of uh, Earth. Um, and then I had gone uh, to a fancy liberal arts college and, and sort of some of those intuitions developed further, you know, reading people like Foucault or Gramsci um, and particularly Gramsci and his idea of like an organic intellectual and the idea that um, the sort of role of an intellectual in some ways is to interpret their local milieu and that it's through paying close attention to the things that are actually in front of you um, that you're able to kind of share something worthwhile with other people and that it's kind of a job of a writer to, um, to just pay attention to their backyard. Um, and um, this also, I'll say, was happening in the backdrop in the 90s of um, a very pronounced rise in a kind of globalist uh, mentality and the, the construction of the internet and the, the idea that local culture was, um, was uh, disappearing and that we were entering into some sort of global um, consciousness that rendered um, the, the province or the uh, region like irrelevant and obsolete in some way. So um, <laughs> within that context, of course, my impulse was well then, um, yeah, I wanna be a minor regionalist writer. <laughs> like that, uh, as long as everyone else is going global, I'm gonna go local. You know, this seems uh, like only the stupidest thing I could possibly do. So um, that um, was, was just sort of conceptually 
an important shaping thing for me. Like I'm not, I'm not interested in uh, Microsoft or NAFTA. I'm against those things. I'm going to um, pay attention to this. Um, so, um, so I had, so, so yeah, so there are a few, so I've got, okay, I want a thing going back and forth in time. I want to cook. I want it having to do with um, uh, um, this uh, like regionalist kind of history. Um, that still needed a few other catalysts to kind of figure out what was going to happen. And one of those things um, was, uh, oops, um, I'm going to show you something else here. Um, I mean, part of, part of writing a novel or making any kind of art is it's figuring out what moves you, fi finding out what you like so you can make more of it. And so there was an artwork that was, um, to me, very powerful. Um, and I will share it with you now. Um, it's by an artist named David Wanarovich, who's from uh, New York. Maybe some of you guys know David Wanarovich. He was a big um, he, he was a big artist in the 80s and sadly uh, died of AIDS. He was a, a, a big act up uh, activist. Um, and um, he made um, like very, um, God, I, I don't know, a, a really diverse range of art. But this is a, a part of his uh, work was photography. And he was also a writer. He wrote a, a really beautiful book called Close to the Knives. <clears throat> but um, I'll go ahead and read this to you because um, I haven't read it for a while. Hopefully I won't start weeping because it actually is a poem that I have found like really gorgeous. Um, when I put my hands on your body, on your flesh, <clears throat> I feel the history of that body, not just the beginning of its forming in that distant lake, but all the way beyond its ending. I feel the warmth and texture, texture and simultaneously, I see the flesh, um, oh shit, I can barely unwrap from the layers of fat and disappear. I see um, the fat disappear from the muscle. I see the muscle disappearing from around uh, the organs and detaching, um, sorry, I'm having trouble reading it over this, uh, from the bones. Uh, I see the organs gradually fade into transparency, leaving gleaming skeletons, um, gleaming like ivory that slowly revolves <clears throat> until it becomes dust. I am consumed in the, oh shit, the sense of your weight, the way your flesh occupies momentary space fullness of it beneath my palms. I'm amazed how perfectly your body fits to the curves <clears throat> of my hands. If I could, atta <clears throat> if I could at attach um, our blood vessels so we could become each other, I would. If I could attach our um, blood vessels in order to anchor you to the earth, to this present time, to me, I would. If I could open your body and slip up inside your skin and look out your uh, and look out your eyes and forever have my lips fused with yours, I would. It makes me weep to feel the history of you, <clears throat> of your flesh beneath my hands, in a way of <clears throat> in a time of so much loss. It makes me to weep <clears throat> to feel the movement of your flesh beneath my palms as you twist <clears throat> and turn over to one side um, to create a series of gestures to reach up around my neck to draw me nearer. All these moments will be lost in time like tears in the rain. Um, I just loved that piece and, that, and I loved um, this photograph that he took, which is actually, I think, uh, down in Mexico um, of these two uh, skeletons that were buried together. Um, I did not realize when I first read this, um, here I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I did not realize when I first read that poem and saw that artwork, that that final line is actually from the movie Blade Runner. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I found it just an utterly gorgeous line. Um, it might it might conceivably um, go back to um, it might be something that they pilfered from Goethe or something, or it might be something that Rutger Hauer improvised on set. Like it's a little unclear to me. Um, but I found that poem, there is something, there's a kind of a purity and a, um, a romance to that poetry, to, to that piece of art that I, <clears throat> I wanted as a kind of anchor in the book. You know, I, I wanted to get to a point where a character could, could um, speak that or feel that. And uh, it created a kind of um, cornerstone for me that I knew was going to be something late in the book that was going to um, come to that feeling. Um, and in fact, it ended up coming like exactly to that feeling because I really took that and got permission from the Wanarovich archive to just use it. And because it was one of those things where it's like, I can't fucking write something that good. So like, I'm just going to use what I found and create an, a, an incredibly elaborate framework to um, justify that theft. And so, um, so I had, um, so, okay, so you, you see some of the things that are kind of working around in, in, the, in the system here, right? Um, clearly, oh, oh, and the other thing about those two skeletons that I thought was nice was it kind of reminded me of um, the Kennewick Man. If you guys remember the Kennewick Man was a, um, a, a, a a skull that was unburied on the Columbia River um, that became um, controversial because for a while it seemed like it might imply um, a different kind of model of, of um, sort of prehistoric migration. Like they were trying to spin it as a possible um, uh, European um, sort of predecessor to um, First Nations people. Um, but uh, it was an interesting kind of local story and, and, and the idea of skeletons, buried skeletons, things like that, it seemed like it, it, I, I could see how skeletons could be the sort of binding thing between two, two time periods. So I knew how, how to cook. I had this sort of skeleton binding idea. It still left um, the problem of, and so you see maybe where this is resolving, like, I've got the past time, I need then a present time if I'm gonna do that thing. And so um, the question of what the present time plot was gonna be, you know, was an open question. And to me, this is like actually a point in the conceiving of something where it becomes kind of fun because you've sort of narrowed down your problem in a way. And suddenly like not everything is relevant anymore. Like you kind of need to like think a little bit more concretely and you've, you've boxed yourself in. I mean, this is also just an aside, but the pleasure of writing a novel is imprisoning yourself in something for multiple years. It's like, it, it's like you have a thing you have to think about when you wake up and you don't have to like worry about all that shit that you otherwise might, you know? So um, you want to find something that you can meditate on for a long time. Um, so, um, <laughs> so the... I was, as I said, I was in my late twenties, like my life experience was limited. Um, what I, one thing I had spent my twenties doing um, was making a movie, um, uh, not like a film movie, but a movie um, through our local cable access network, um, Portland Cable Access. Um, it's a very difficult thing to explain. Um, it was, um, not good. <laughs> it was not a good movie. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was a large project. It was a feature length thing. I'll, I'll go ahead and show you like a little clip of it. Um, the concept of it was, um, it was a, it in itself was an adaptation of a comic strip called Croc that some of you might remember. It was like, um, uh, a sister or brother to the comic strips Wizard of Id and um, uh, BC, if you know those daily comic strips. Um, Croc was the French Foreign Legion version of that. Um, and it was about a garrison in the French Foreign Legion uh, um, uh, presided over by an evil commandant named uh, Vermin Pierre Croc. And then all the various, um, you know, uh, legionnaires and natives and 
concubines and stuff that like populated that strip. It was, I mean, it was, it was a bizarre, <laughs> truly bizarre comic strip. And so, yeah, of course it seemed like a good idea to um, do a feature length adaptation with no uh, intellectual property permission. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, we actually did get a cease and desist order, um, but I will show you like, We'll fast forward through the whole thing very quickly here, okay? Um, <laughs> let's see if I can make this happen. All right, here we go. Um, are you guys seeing this in a... Is that... Um... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we're gonna... This is best seen very quickly. So this is the comic strip, if you remember, possibly. The, the movie did have a soundtrack. Um, the opening credits take 10 minutes to go. Then it's like basically just lines from the comic strip for a while. Then um, gradually a, a plot line develops with people um, uh, trying to steal Croc's iron fist. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, oh, there, this is a scene that I kind of stole from a Cocteau movie. Um, uh, to uh, cut my uh, fist. Blah blah blah. Anyway, you get the idea, right? Um, it is thing uh, so uh, much as Hawk sharing. himself. Uh, I assume inside oh, here is calling out to Hawk. Oh, sorry. Try <laughs> with me, Hawk. Free me <laughs> from these not Hawks. Wait. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm trying. Hawk, you. Shit, I'm getting lost here. Hawk, 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 to hawk. Cock, cock, cock. Sassy okay, there we go. There we go. Stop, right? Now you can see me, right? Okay. Um, the, the most sort of interesting, I'll just go ahead and tell you the most like notable part of that movie is um, there, there is a scene in which I actually shit an egg. Uh, that was sort of part of the um, part of the um, provocation of that movie. But anyway, the point is not anything really about the movie. The point is that I spent two years making that movie with a lot of friends. And I did have the experience of thus of making a movie and, uh, and also all the, um, the sort of um, collateral um, issues of, of collaboration and friendship and uh, frustration and envy and um, anger and disappointment that went with uh, doing a project that um, is, is really a, a, a failure. Um, uh, and so I was um, interested in sort of repurposing that then in some way in the contemporary uh, storyline that I had. And so um, the contemporary storyline became a story about two teenage girls who um, make a film together or attempt to make a film together. And so, um, what I, and I was just, I was interested in friendship as a, as a possible also um, sort of uh, uh, theme. Um, I was under the impression, I think that friendship was an under, under um, explored literary, um, literary idea. Um, again, I hadn't been like, I mean, the Epic of Gilgamesh is about friendship. It's not an underdeveloped uh, theme at all, but I, in my mind, it seemed um, out of fashion in a certain way. And I wanted to um, do something about friendship. And so um, the pieces then started to resolve a little bit more quickly. And I'll just very quickly give you the sort of like plot that ended up happening in this, in this uh, book, again, towards the adaptation that happened recently. In the book, um, uh, it opens in 1820, thereabouts, um, and that cookie character is a young man, uh, and he encounters um, a fur trapper in the uh, Oregon Territory um, in what would eventually become Portland um, named Henry Brown, and they uh, initiate a friendship with each other. Um, cookie, you know, is a gentle soul. Uh, Henry Brown is a charismatic sort of uh, swashbuckling American kind of figure. Um, and they um, um, 
have an, an immediate sort of uh, bond. Um, then meanwhile, in the mid 1980s, uh, a teenage girl named Tina Plank um, moves to Oregon um, with her mother uh, and um, they uh, land in a commune uh, outside of Portland in the hills outside of Portland um, and they embark on a friendship. Um, meanwhile, uh, the owner of the land of that commune, uh, a character named Neil Rust, <coughs> um, discovers two skeletons on the property in a um, dried up um, bog. Um, and this, I think, actually is an important um, um, craft uh, lesson to impart at this moment. Um, I wanted to have a double barreled um, uh, novel that like went back and forth between these two friendships. I quickly realized though that um, if I wanted the skeleton thing, the sort of main structuring device, it was too much to implant into the teenage girl um, storyline. Like it just, it created too much material. And so I needed to actually have a third line. I needed to have that different character who basically was responsible for presiding over the whole um, issue of the skeletons because otherwise it was just too much. And so even though the goal had been two, it ended up becoming a three part sort of thing. And, and that just was a, a more sturdy, um, a more sturdy sort of tripod for the whole thing to work on. And that, um, that sort of, um, that, that has been a useful lesson for me to understand that like sometimes you just have to break off a piece of it and give it to something else. So um, the, the storyline proceeds and the, um, uh, the, in, the, in the old time story, the, the, they both sort of embark on schemes. And so the um, Cookie character and Henry Brown um, are um, part of the, the nascent um, uh, uh, fur trapping uh, industry that has taken over the region at that point. I mean, it's an interesting time in our region's history. It's, it's not America yet um, in this particular plot line. Um, it's actually, um, the, <clears throat> it's, and it's actually a very diverse group of people who are living in the Columbia Basin. You know, there are people from uh, England and France and Russia, from China, from um, ho uh, Hawaii at that time, the Sandwich Islands, um, plus all the um, indigenous peoples, and they've all they've all been brought together because of the um, because of the global trade in um, in fur. And so, I guess in, in part, like I was trying to kind of retell the story of of my backyard as actually the origin of globalism. Like we, this is sort of in a sense where globalism began. Like literally, I mean, this is the first circumnavigation of the world to um, with uh, uh, commodities in that way. Um, they end up um, having their little scheme where they um, take castorium oil from the anal glands of beavers and cast away on a um, ship to Canton. That is part of, that is actually part of the, the fur route at that time um, in order to um, sell their commodity in China. Um, meanwhile, well, I'll go ahead and tell you their whole story. Um, once there, the, the, their, their plot goes awry. Uh, Cookie, our poor Cookie character, is now stranded in China and is actually put in prison there. Um, and uh, there's actually a chapter in which 40 years elapses, um, uh, during which he, uh, is a, he's been abandoned by his friend Henry and he switches his affection to a Chinese calligrapher who's also imprisoned with him. And, they end up having um, uh, a very uh, intimate and, and possibly even romantic friendship in prison, all of which, as I said, elapsed in, in a chapter that um, jumped 40 years. Uh, the girls, meanwhile, have their um, plot line that uh, involves, you know, buying a camera, uh, funding their movie with, um, uh, some marijuana plants. Um, uh, um, it results in like helicopters and death. Um, I'm trying to move quickly around here because really 
the point I'm trying to make and even telling you about the plot of the, of the Half-Life, the book, um, is that it was sort of epic. It was um, a quiet book. Um, I wanted it to be a, a sort of quiet, um, almost whispered sort of feeling in that book. Um, I was reading a lot of Sherwood Anderson at that time, who is a, a major hero for me. Um, but the, um, the, uh, the scope of the book was, was large. Um, and, and as you can also tell, it was complex. I mean, it was not, um, it was not a simple book. Like when I think of the book now, I think of it almost as a piece of like outsider art, you know, it's like a collage of a bunch of different things. It's almost like a, a doll with a bunch of pins in it or something. Um, I was doing what I think people do and drawing in a bunch of um, influences and things I liked and trying to wrestle it into some sort of coherent uh, or a shape that I found interesting. Um, and, you know, I will say it ended up being a unique book. You know, it's not like anyone else. It's not like a lot of other books that <laughs> were written at that time or ever. Um, it, uh, it was not a popular book. It's not something that people read. Um, but to me, it was actually a very life-changing experience in that it got published. Um, there were people who, there were some people who liked it. Um, and thankfully among that very small handful of people was my dear friend, uh, Kelly Reichert, who is a filmmaker. Um, and because of reading that book, enlisted me in a collaboration that now has gone on to five films um, and which has become like a, a very huge part of my life. Um, and so, I mean, there is a certain irony in a sense that, you know, what started as a, a way of sort of um, healing myself from a failed filmmaking experience and sort of composting it into fiction um, then did blossom into more filmmaking on the other side in some kind of way. Um, and that's just one of those actually very delightful ironies that I think can happen in a creative life if you stick with it for a long time. Like there are strange ways in which um, these things return or, or mutate. Um, but okay, so, so hopefully you guys understand there is a, a big strange um, novel. Um, and as I said, I have had this relationship with Kelly for now um, 15 years or so. And probably three years ago or so, we decided to take a crack at um, adapting the half-life. We had adapted some short stories that I had written and I had written like regular scripts uh, from the ground up for her. And um, they've also very much partaken of this regionalist sort of sensibility. Um, they've all taken place in Oregon. Um, they've all you know, had that kind of interest. Um, and so um, the, um, once again, so we were faced with just a creative problem, like, uh, you know, Kelly, we, we had talked about trying to adapt the, the, the book for a long time. We clearly did not have the resources to adapt it in its entirety. Like there's no way we could go to China. There's no way we could um, express something on film like a 40 year relationship in a, you know, 12 pages. There's a, um, there, you know, we couldn't do helicopters. Like we wouldn't want to do helicopters. Like there's just a lot of stuff that we, that was not useful to us in the book. And so the initial, um, the initial conversations became about uh, what sliver of it to do. Um, like what, like, and so immediately it's like, do we want to do the contemporary thing with like a couple girls making a, um, making a movie? Cause that's, that's nice. We like that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> or do we want to go with the old timey story line with fur trappers? And, um, quickly we went with the latter and, um, admittedly part of that is a material question, like to do trappers, um, like, you just need to be in the woods, you know, like you don't need a lot of sets. You don't need to get, um, you don't need buildings. You don't need, um, they're just like fewer people, more controlled situations. Um, it was a more doable um, 
project. Um, but the storyline that exists in the book doesn't really in itself go all the way, you know? I mean, it, it is, it's really built in conjunction with this other, with this other storyline and, and really um, it, it doesn't, and, and still even in that old storyline, they go to China, we couldn't do that. Um, and so, um, so yeah, all right, I've been speaking like very mechanistically about how to assemble a novel and like the sort of very nuts and bolts sorts of ideas that go into it. But I will, I will turn at this point and, and speak of magic a little bit more and like those things that sometimes happen that you don't plan. But it should be clear it's all based on that kind of uh, construction work that was done before. Like I understood as this question was posed, like how do we, how do we turn this story of this trapper, this, this wagon train cook into a, sorry, there's a cat walking around right here. Um, how do we turn that into like a film? And thankfully, you know, having written the book, I knew the themes, you know, I knew the characters quite well. I knew the geography of the whole thing. <clears throat> you know, I understood that part of at least my interest was um, uh, global capitalism and, and the sort of birth of that sort of um, system. And so we couldn't have them go somewhere. And so immediately the question is, well, maybe something can come to them. Maybe like uh, we can have the system, but rather than it, 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 it travels to them. And I don't know why um, I thought of a cow. Um, it was just one of those things that kind of like, I was walking around and just sort of, it was one of those very, lovely sort of intuitions like what if a cow came to them like there's no cow in the half-life that it, it doesn't exist um but it occurred to me like it, maybe this is about the time that dairy cows appeared in our region and if a cow shows up um what would that enable to happen like we have a cook you know um he would want to use the milk um he would milk that cow um, whose cow would it be? Um, it would probably belong to the chief factor of the, um, in the film, it became a kind of thinly disguised Hudson's Bay Company um, uh, uh, outpost. Um, and then the, the next question then, and so who would he befriend though? Like who, who is the cook and a befriend? There's a cow, there's a cook. Um, and the, um, the sort of two friends that Cookie in the book has, this like initial guy that takes him to China and then this Chinese calligrapher that he ends up sort of living his life with, um, ended up sort of combining. <clears throat> and it's like, it would be much more interesting if the person he met in Oregon in 1820 was himself a Chinese immigrant. And so um, we have this old cook or we have this cook we have um, a cow um, um, and um, then the script I was able to write in like a week. It was very fast. It was like, um, okay, these guys are gonna milk the cow. Um, they're gonna get into trouble with um, the chief factor. Um, you know, what are they gonna make? Well, you know, in Portland donuts are popular. Maybe they'll make some sort of proto donut and it's like, doing a quick batch of research and discovering a thing called the oily cake, which was the sort of predecessor to the donut. And it was kind of like an elephant ear, which is something that one would get at the Saturday market here in Portland. And it's like, oh, that's the thing that they make. And then, um, well, a complication would be that the chief factor asks Cookie to make him something. And so what would he make? Well, my wife likes to make a claw tea. Why doesn't I'll make it a claw tea? And so, um, these things just started pouring in very quickly and um, the film, the, the script happened, yeah, like I said, very quickly. And then it's like one of those, it ended up being one of those incredibly, it'll never happen like this again. I mean, the script was done. We were funded then like within a matter of weeks and shooting the film in, like it was written, the initial draft was written in like May or June and we were shooting it in September or October. 
Um, and it's just like, that. that is unheard of. That's just an insanity. Um, and more so than that though, it was, um, it was a, it was like a joyful filmmaking experience, which is a sentence that is almost never spoken. Um, <laughs> the process of making movies is genuinely, is, is generally really arduous and, and terrible for everyone involved. For me, it's not that bad because I'm just sitting at home. Like my work is done by the time the production is happening. But um, on this one, like just something happened that um, was very lovely. And I think it partly had to do with um, uh, the sort of theme, you know, it was a movie that was about friendship as the book had been about, and it kind of coalesced a, a, a friendship among all the people involved and um, uh, became, uh, it, it kind of um, sort of uh, fulfilled its own kind of uh, um, thematic prophecy in a certain way. I mean, there were, um, yeah, there was just a kind of a, a warmth of the whole thing that was very, very strange and lovely. Um, and so, um, I mean, that's, I guess that's sort of the, the story that I wanted to tell you right now. I, God, I've gone way too long, I think, but I'm happy to sit here and answer questions for you guys. Um, I guess the lesson that I want to end with there is just that, um, like, books have a long life and you don't know exactly what's going to happen with them. And it's um, actually sometimes like very lovely afterlives can happen in that kind of way. You don't know how they're going to end up um, uh, affecting the world. Um, and thus it's good to um, choose themes and images and subjects um, that you know you will never be finished with, um, that you are willing to have revisit you in some kind of way. Um, and it's uh, because you're kind of putting something out there that uh, <laughs> you should be careful about because it might, it might come back at you. <laughs> um, um, so, okay, that's what I've done. Sorry, I, I had not timed this before. I didn't realize how long that was gonna take. I apologize <laughs> for taking so long, but um, I'm happy to like talk to you guys. However, I got nothing to do. I'm just sitting here in Oregon, so. <laughs> in, in the pandemic, just like that, I do, I do, there are some questions. Um, someone said, someone asked that, you know, you, you said part of writing a novel is finding out what moves you. Yeah. And can you sort of elaborate on, and, and in fact, we talked about this in our class, is that, you know, you, ha you do have many, many ideas. Um, and, and we can be excited for them for a day or two, but, but something that moves you is different than thinking, oh, I've got a good idea. Yeah. I wish I had a lot of ideas. I don't have that many ideas. So it is like there are occasionally an idea that happens. Yeah. But, um, but I think the, to me, what's move, what, what I was talking about with being moved by something is not like my own idea, but it's paying attention to when you're moved by other things, you know? I mean, it's watching a movie or looking at a piece of art or reading a book. You know, I can say I like wept when I, on the last page of uh, Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, you know? And there was something on that page that really, really got to me. And it's just good to notice that for yourself. Like that was something that really, really nailed something and it's different for different people you know like I can find in my own life history and relationships like some triggers for why some of those things happen but um it's being a good reader that I'm talking about or not a good reader but being an attentive reader mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so when you um you you mentioned that the script when you sat and wrote the script that you wrote it very quickly um, what was the experience of writing that script like after having written the prose? And when you say very quickly, was it, you know, could you describe just a little bit about the collaboration with Kelly? Did you just go in your room and, or, you know, it sounds like there were also a lot of very practical considerations as there are when you go from film, from, from prose, where yeah. you can go to China and you can right. have a helicopter. And so what part of it was you just want to, in your room and what part of it were, were the two of you sort of trying to figure out? Um, how yeah, 
Um, I mean, the pattern is for us is generally um, the, um, I mean, there's conversation kind of um, leading up into the idea, like, you know, often, I mean, generally they have been kind of uh, ideas or sort of worlds that I've kind of presented in some way, you know, like how about a drifter story or how about a, a story about uh, pioneers, uh, you know, settlers crossing the desert. Um, and so that gets that that sort of there's an initial conversation of being like okay that sounds good let's let's do that you know um, and so in this case yeah that was all sort of framed by what was in the book like I was saying like here's the let's do the old time story um, then like I had the idea for the for the cow and I was and <laughs> I mean that was a, a great non conversation I remember like Colin Kelly I'm like how about a cow and she's like yes. <laughs> like there was no question it was just like she was in with a cow like even though there was not yet a sense of like how the cow would behave or what was going to happen and then it becomes my job to sort of create the initial um you know plot structure and the characters and the basic scenes and stuff and um you know give us give us a draft to work with so i go in and and do that and then it becomes like a conversation again and there's just tons of you know um background things to fill out or beats to like change or um you know um uh uh scenes to swap back and forth that then may end up becoming what they were at the beginning but still you have to kind of go through that whole process but um for me what i'm saying about as far as writing it in like a, a week or two it was to come to that initial draft and then you know i mean in a sense it's continues to be written through production yeah, yeah. not not that the not that the script changes but just that the the people in the different departments all are incredibly talented and amazing people and have ideas that kind of beef things up or or torque them in a certain way and um you know they they become collaborators in the process as well um after after that you know after kelly and i have sort of done as much as we can and so um uh so yeah i mean it's nice to say it, it was a very fast process but it that that's that it was really only a piece of the of the writing right. but but it did stay that way you know i mean it was it, that was the groundwork so um so when you you know you talked about really wonderfully i thought about um you know all the different places where you drew your inspiration but then when you sat down to actually you know put the words on paper do you do you use an outline or you do you diagram or how do you actually build the plot once you've sort of assembled all of these components that you want to work with um yeah that uh can vary i will say i really favor the um legal pad of paper like i like a legal sized uh, <laughs> piece of paper um that then can be turned sideways and can be done you can create sort of graphic sort of outlines in a certain way for me that's been like a really useful way of doing it and like um sometimes those can go up on the like uh wall or something but they also just sort of get transposed sort of draft to draft and and like um yeah for me it, it's uh it, it's sort of columns i like to start creating columns that to me is helpful cool yeah. um someone asked that you know when you say cow i think humor do mm -hmm. you imagine the tone of your films as you construct them in the script yeah oh yeah absolutely um and uh the and this one did have a comic sort of um a light comic tone to it um uh it's funny to think is there a cow well yeah there's probably i think there's a there's a brisson movie with a cow that's not particularly funny um but otherwise cows are, <laughs> cows are uh, it could not be it could be sort of horrifying actually but. <laughs> yeah but it's true that the cow brought a kind of comic warmth to it but yeah i mean definitely the um i mean the the job of screenwriting is is weird and i describe it in different ways depending on who i'm talking to um you know in some conversations i'm willing to really indulge my contempt for screenwriting i mean it is not really writing you know it's not um 
It's not like building an actual paragraph with breath, you know, that takes you from one thought to the next. It's just not as hard. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to like, uh, yeah, diminish it. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes you're talking to people who actually really don't understand how fundamental it is to the filmmaking process. And then I will stand up for uh, screenwriting and be like, actually, it's more than just like throwing some words in there. I mean, it, it is the actual blueprint for what happens. Um, and there's a visual sense and a time sense and a um, character sense that is, uh, you know, on the page in some kind of way. And, and it's, it's like, you know, someday, someday an enterprising Frenchman will think up an auteur theory for authors, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because like there is a lot of authorship that goes into it on the writing side of it. And like, it can be annoying to have people not understand that. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's not the whole story, so. Um, how, how involved were you in the casting and the costumes and the sets and the other kind of atmospheric elements and, and um, actual filmmaking? Not, not that much. I mean, I've been lucky in that um, Kelly's been very generous to kind of include me in those conversations. Um, and so I'm definitely like, having conversations about the casting. It's, it's um, I'm, I'm one voice among multiple, but it is, you know, it's, I think it's smart and useful to bounce things off the person who, you know, was initially thinking of it. So, um, but that said, you know, I, there's, it's not like I have like a vote, you know, it's more like it's just sort of a, a, a soft power, you know? Um, and uh, that uh, that extends to the to the casting, I think mostly. But then, really, like for Kelly, the conversation becomes so engrossing with the different departments. Um, uh, you know, on First Cow, for instance, the costumes were by uh, a woman named April Napier and her whole team, who were just incredible. And they, um, you know, they're swapping photographs and and books and. Uh, doing research and and rummaging for stuff and there's nothing I, I just basically like look at it and I'm like that's amazing I can't believe you yeah. did that that's incredible so similar thing with the um, you know uh, you know prop stuff and the um, art direction like there's um, there are I'm 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 like a vestigial limb at that point and it just sort of goes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think we have time for one more because we are, um, we are getting on here. Um, has your novel writing changed in any way process wise since you've been doing all of this work with screenwriting and filmmaking? Um, yeah, I, well, let's see, I'd say yes and no, and I, I don't know how they're related. I mean, it's not like there's been like a ton of novels, you know, it's not like there's some huge <laughs> like control to, to understand it all through. But like, I'll say, um, um, and, and the kind of like fiction writing I do does have an inherent connection to um, film. I, I mean, I write pretty naturalist sort of fiction and that translates into film sort of um, rhythms pretty, pretty easily. So um, there's kind of a, a a connection to begin with, but I think, you know, I think I've gotten a little more adept at, at understanding how to shape a scene and, you know, the ins and the outs and the transitions and stuff like that. Um, I will say like this, I just have did a project during quarantine, which was uh, nice to be able to do that um, was a shorter novel than I've done before. And uh, involved more handwriting before getting into the digital part of it. Like I wanted to try and like outline it and even start writing sentences um, like before getting onto the screen as much as possible, just because I'm so fucking sick of like being on a screen. And, and um, that was, uh, that was actually really helpful and useful. And, and part of that like dreaming process was I think facilitated by working on paper. Um, you know, I would love to talk to you about this more because I found doing a lot more handwriting during quarantine as well. But um, oh, wow. 
alas, we have to let our, I always think of them as our kids. We have to let our kids get their beauty, well, sleep, nourishment. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can lure John down to Todos Santos one of these years soon. Yeah, so we can ask him many, many, many more questions. I have more questions too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, thank you guys thank so you much for so listening. Much. Sorry, I like, yeah, I feel like I went, uh, whatever, should have timed it better, but thank you guys so much for listening. Oh, it was perfect. Um, it was wonderful. Yeah. Cool. And I'll talk to you guys See later. You, John. Bye.